afternoon, everyone who's watching us right now. Yeah, so this panel is uh, pre-recorded, and we're going to talk about uh, video games, the narrative part of video games, and most importantly, the cultural part of making your games, like implementing cultural stuff in your game. And for this panel, uh, I think let me introduce myself first. My name is Muhammad Fahmi. You can just call me Fahmi because Indonesian don't really have the concept of first name or last name. Unless if you're a royal family or something. I'm not a royal family, sadly. And then, uh, uh, I was part of Toge Productions up until late, like early this year. And I was the writer and game designer of Coffee Talk. And right now I left the company to start my own game. An announced title, but yeah, hopefully things will go all right. And wish me luck with that with that title. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, good luck with that. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> I will get a lot of luck. And so I guess next one is Ollie. You can start introducing yourself. Hello, uh, I'm Ollie Clark Smith in the UK. Uh, my internet hacker name is just Choppermon, so people might know me as that. Uh, I am the co founder and creative director of Kaizen Gameworks, a new UK studio making Paradise Killer. Previously, I worked on stuff like Until Dawn and 50 Cent Blood on the Sand. So, if you want to talk about cultural issues in video games, I am the guy to speak to after 50 Cent <laughs> rampage across the Middle East. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much for having me here. <laughs> okay. And then Fernando? Uh, yes, yes. My name is Fernando Damas. I'm the writer and programmer of Sukeban Games. We made that one, Bart Cyberpunk Bartending game that some people talk about, Valhalla Cyberpunk Bartender Action. Mm -hmm. And we're currently working on, on the it's not a sequel, but okay. it's a continuation uh, called Nirvana, Cyber Bombardier Action. Um, I guess before we start with the main question, I mean, like, I want to know how did you guys start uh, jumping to the game industry? Like, how did you get into making and writing video games mainly? Uh, I think we can start with Fernando. That's a funny story actually because for the longest time I didn't actually I didn't actually even think about making games. Okay. I was I, w I just wanted to make stuff. That was always like a preform thing for me. I was like during uh, elementary school I tried drawing comics, then during high school I tried uh, writing. It was always like an impetus to make things. There was a time where I did oil painting and stuff, oh, and wow. then when I got into college, I met Chris, or the other co-founder of Sukeban Games, and one of the things he actually told me, he just told me, do you want to make a game together? I told him yes, and that's how I got brought into this situation. It just so happened that games were exactly the medium I was looking for. Oh, I was looking for something that let me that let me explore a different side of things in a, or things in a different way and and that let me write in a way that neither novels nor comics let me and well it just so happened that games turned out to be that thing okay. but if I I'd be lying if I said like it was a childhood dream or something like that <laughs> so I mean like does it mean that Valhalla is your first game ever no oh no we released a, we released um, about two or three games before okay. Valhalla. Okay. Very small games, okay. and we had one big project that Valhalla was originally going to be like the thing we were going to do mm -hmm. to finance that big project, but okay. it turned out the other project we outgrew the other project and ended up. Uh, Putting it in indefinite stasis for now, and Valhalla ended up being the the main breadmaker, so to speak. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, 
Oli, you haven't told us about your background. Like, what makes you jump to video games? Uh, I got into video games about 16 years ago, oh, wow. and I was in school in a punk band uh, with the guy that I formed Kaizen with, and uh, I didn't want to go to uni like all my friends did, uh, because I was too punk, and uh, we, so I was looking for just a job. I was running a uh, record label, trying to run a record label uh, for local punk bands, and there was a job just advertised to test Tomb Raider. So I went to test Tomb Raider, Angel of Darkness on the PS2, and that game was awful. Just a terrible, <laughs> terrible game. <laughs> so uh, when that happened, uh, they cut the test department, and then everyone scattered and went to different companies, and then I got a job as a designer working on some PS2 stuff, and then jumped to 360 to do 50 cents, and then made some very, very bad shooting games after that and then uh eventually ended up at uh, supermassive to do until dawn and man of the dan and then in 2018 i quit to form kaizen oh, nice. that's the most british game developer story yeah. i've ever <laughs> I guess heard I'm say that, right? so everything like... from starting at, at school and then being in a band <laughs> and then not what to the college for making it. it's like, like so... i'm pretty sure i've heard this story with other British developers from the it's, it's, Amiga Iron stuff. So. Mm, it yeah. was the right time where they, they, there was just a lot of studios. There's less studios now. I, I've been through so many studio closes, closures because the 360 era was savage to studios. And um, so you end up just bouncing around between different studios. Uh, it's, it's different now where, uh, you know, that we didn't have tools, it sounded like an old man, but we didn't have Unity and Unreal back in the day. Uh, so no one just made games themselves in the kind of like the PS2 era because the jump from, you know, Amiga and stuff to consoles was too big. Uh, so it's very exciting to see now, like as it has been for a few years, just people just, they haven't been through the ringer of studios. They haven't been ground down by studios. They have made their own studio and uh, uh, make something really cool. And I was very glad to hear that Valhalla was not your first game, because if that was your first game, I was getting very upset about the state of Oh, no, man, no, no. We, <laughs> we had an expert time to just get the bad out of our system and just make kind of bad. Even Valhalla <laughs> is like the third iteration of the game, because cool. we had the prototype, and then we had the prologue. And then we had the final game, and then we had to fix the final game, and so on and so forth. So yeah, don't worry, we have a lot of time to just... By the way, I think, um, uh, I actually started my game jobs in a mobile game company called Gameloft. So yeah, uh, I started working there as a programmer, and then I moved to game design, and then I somehow changed into game journalism, local game journalist. Oh. And I moved to Toge as marketing and PR, and I made Coffee Talk, and I found that making games is way more fun than selling games. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I decided to leave and try to make my own game right now. Uh, so, like, um, I start with Oli. Like, how can you explain to us about Paradise Killer and how you came up with the idea and why did you start to work on the game? Uh, Paradise Killer is a first-person open-world murder mystery game where we never ask you to find the true ending. We only care that you prove your truth. So what we wanted to do was take like traditional murder mystery games and stories, which are very linear, and blow it out and make it completely freeform and allow you to find evidence in any order, testimony in any order, make dialogue choices that will determine whether you get evidence. And then when you go to trial at the end of the game, you uh, are not trying to find the one correct ending, you are trying to prove, for each crime, there's a series of crimes which led up to the main crime, okay. you are trying to prove who you think did it. And there's always multiple valid suspects, so we're, making you, we're asking the player to interpret the evidence and their knowledge, and uh, then present evidence to prove it. I'm a huge fan of Danganronpa and Phoenix Wright, but those games, especially Danganronpa, are... Too linear. Yeah, 
And I don't mind that. I don't think Lydia is bad. It's just that I find it somewhat frustrating in those games where you get given loads of evidence and then you go to trial and you have to get the correct answer. Otherwise you fail and then you retry and you just keep retrying until you get the right answer like, because you haven't made the logic jumps in your head that the designer has. So we wanted to do something different with that. And I, like one of my previous games was Until Dawn, which was like a, a, a branching narrative, but it starts and then branches and then does that. Like it never just goes in any direction. So we wanted to try and do something like that. And uh, and then we wanted to set it in a fantasy world so we could have weird characters and a strange place because everyone watches CSI, everyone knows how murder investigations are conducted, but we wanted to control the world. We wanted to control the world that you're in and the rules uh, and allow players to construct a framework of very definite possibilities rather than like, you know, in the real world, if you're a detective, you can do 11 billion things, but in our game, we needed to bring that down to a more manageable number and then control the fiction around it. Yeah, I mean, like, that sounds like, uh, because you're British, that sounds very much like, I don't know, Sherlock Holmes, but mixed with Dangan mm. Rompa. Yes, definitely. It, the description that reminds me, reminded me a bit of what Elaine Ward tried to do, but like actually further into what they tried to do. <laughs> yeah, because again, that was a very linear thing of like you need to get this evidence to progress, or uh, Elaine like Ward had one of three branches that you could go down, whereas we just want you to do... You can finish our game in the first 20 minutes, because you get to the island, you get told who the prime suspect is, and if you want to go to trial and just say, yes, it was the prime suspect, go nuts, there's a 20-minute playthrough. Or you can have a 20-hour playthrough by doing everything. Okay, so uh, the, main, the main theme of our panel is cultural dissonance, exploring and learning the Angnam to put into your story. So the... The initial idea that made me came out with this uh, title is because I think I told you guys before, but we need to tell the uh, people out there. Uh, it's because when I work with, when I work on Coffee Talk, we have this uh, story arc about a succubus and an elf, a lovebirds, but they cannot get married because their family won't allow them to, and it. It's like one of the main arc of the game, and the game is set in Seattle, in, in the US, and the way I treat the game was actually like the way I treat how Asian people uh, interact with relationships and their family approval. And one day suddenly, my team member told me like, you're making this kind of story, but if we're talking about something that is set in the US, that thing won't work. People, I mean like, if their parents don't allow them to get married, they will just leave the family. That's what happens in the West, but that's not what happens in Asia. But I was putting Asia for a game that is set in the US, which is like, it's kind of surprising me because I didn't expect this kind of problem to happen. And we ended up like fixing it without changing too much of the game. <coughs> Sorry, that's a motorcycle out there. And like, Mm -hmm. uh, we decided to change like only one of the character motivation and somehow we survived uh, that trouble and making it more like okay so this the succubus have this culture the elf have this culture and so that's why they cannot really get together from the family i mean like it was pretty surprising but at least we survived so you use so you use the fantasy setting as a way to like pass the the context that you are in the U.S. and that wouldn't happen in the U.S. So it's like, yeah, but this is fantasy setting, so that sort of like that. That's actually pretty cool because it's one of the few cases that I can see the whole using fantasy races as analogs for real life yeah. races thing effectively. Yeah, right. that's kind of the it's point the, of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because usually, usually when you see when you see that sort of thing, it's like, oh, the the elves are just Asian people, but not Asian people because we don't want to be racist, but we want to spur racism <laughs> or something like that. So, to, so it's one thing to just use a cheap analog, mm -hmm. and another different to 
use the context of a fantasy setting to bypass any sort of weird cultural dissonance that might happen, like you mentioned. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's doable, but people will still question stuff. Like, uh, it's actually one funny thing that I miss from the game. Uh, I just noticed after the game is out that uh, two of the characters are smoking inside the cafe, inside the coffee shop, and everyone was saying like, okay, this game is a fantasy because you cannot smoke indoors in the U.S. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do that? <laughs> okay. that? You know, that, that's kind of like those, uh, like those beat em -ups that are set in the U.S. but have vending machines everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you're facing it to the U.S., but you've clearly never been to the U.S. It's just yeah. like, <laughs> the cheese everywhere. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, we, we can use the, it's a fiction and it's a fantasy card, but sometimes people will ask questions and it's kind of hard to answer it, if it's, especially if you have, like, a Discord followers in the Discord community that keep asking, like, uh, it's, this is not U.S., this is not Seattle. Thankfully, uh, we chose Seattle as the setting for Kafka, Coffee talk because of three things, and that thing we kind of nailed it pretty well, so people don't complain that much. The first one um, is coffee shop because Seattle love coffee, and then it rains a lot, and there are a lot of hipsters in Seattle. So I guess we we got saved by those three keywords. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, like mm, let's start with Fernando. Like, do you have like any similar experience with? Valhalla or Nirvana about that, like? I have the weirdest one. Okay. And the one that still kind of hits me from okay. time to time. Basically, the biggest cultural difference I've noticed mm -hmm. between, between where I grew up and mostly the United States is that the United States is full of brutes. <laughs> 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 the biggest thing that that people notice and criticize about Valhalla is always the saucy talk and the way people talk and the way they're open about so many topics. And that's the moment I'm like, I'm like, dude, that's just how people talk where I come from. The, that's just how you see conversations every day. You have people talking about the weirdest and most scandalous stuff, just like, on the dinner table yeah. with two beers or whatever and that's that was the weirdest difference it's like it's like okay apparently i grew up in sex land or something i don't know <laughs> no you have just you saying that has helped me so much because uh i, th I thought the writing in uh fighter games was fantastic uh, but Valhalla, I was really surprised at the kind of deftness of it and the, the some of the subtlety in the conversations where quite big topics would come out very naturally and they didn't feel forced. And I've been looking at the writing I'm doing and worried that it doesn't have uh, that kind of flow to it. And it's because I'm British and in Britain we don't talk about anything. <laughs> like, all your feelings bottled up and uh, hope that they don't kill you early. Uh, it's, and especially me, I'm a very introverted person. I don't, I like dealing with things myself and don't, don't often externalize stuff. Uh, so I think that definitely answered my question as to why my writing is like that. <laughs> no, you see, it, that actually has a weird effect as the years have gone on and as my context of my life has changed because I moved to a different country. Because uh, back in, in school and back in college and stuff, I wasn't, I, I wasn't really that open about those sort of topics. There was, that was stuff I kept mostly to myself. No, relatively speaking, it, it's one of those things that I did, but if I were to compare myself to someone from another country, I'd be probably like the rushiest guy they've ever met or something. <laughs> and I don't know, for the longest time, that gave me that sort of, that sort of doubt on myself that maybe I'm a sexual or something. Is, is something wrong with me? No, no, no. 
it's just that everyone else is too over the top. I'm like, I, I, on, that, on that sense, I'm like, on a regular, maybe a bit above, depending on where I am level, it just so happens that everyone else is on the next level. So it's, it's just a case of the ad trying to deal with the, with, with the dogs or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was that that was the the one that's most pervasive and the one that people have noticed the most. The other one is a more subtle one. It's that people uh, see or writing and they try to pin us on some side of the political spectrum of the U.S. Some people are like, oh, they are clearly leftist, um, and then others are like, oh, they're clearly right wing, and I'm like. Have you ever considered that maybe we don't work on that spectrum at all? Mm. That maybe we're outside of that, so that doesn't apply anyway. <laughs> well, like, people will, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like people will always find something to complain about. I guess, like that's the most. Uh, no, that's that's perfectly normal. That's to be expected. But yeah, it was it. Especially after I, I went out of the country and I had the experience, the time to experience the stuff from other places and whatnot, it's given me a lot of hindsight and context of stuff I took for granted and made me realize some stuff that I realized before. Mm. Funnily enough, I think uh, from what I've seen, Japanese people are less brute than Americans, actually. Okay. Just, uh, Jap Japanese aren't really as much of a, uh, are, aren't brutes in the normal sense. They're just more reserved. Yeah. But, in, but from what I've seen, Japanese are the kind of people that are reserved until they are, until they can see that they are in, in company that lets them open up. And then they'll just start opening up like crazy. It's there's no middle ground in that sense. Yeah, yeah. I can get it. Uh, anyway, uh, Oli, like, so, I guess, what kind of cultural problem you found in Paradise Killer during the development right now? So, excuse me, Paradise Killer is set a bit of backstory. It's set in an island outside of reality. Okay. And in our history of the game, uh, Gods, alien gods came to Earth during man's prehistory and Rose Manor gifted us civilization technology but then forced us to fight in an endless series of wars. Man rose up and betrayed the gods and uh, killed them or imprisoned them. The remaining worshippers of the gods fled to build their own island, Paradise Island. And uh, the, the, those uh, worshippers are known as the Syndicate and they... Um, their, their islands always fail, so they're always building new islands, and they're immortal. So these, these people, this group of people, have existed for millennia, and they've come from all different parts of the world. Um, so what we wanted to do was look at a society that has had time to evolve for outside of reality, away from the real world, and bring in all these different races and cultures and sexualities and genders and see what that looks like. But focused on their holy mission of resurrecting their gods, and then further focused in the context of the game on this crime. So, uh, the someone has killed the council, the ruling elite, and you are there to figure it out, figure out who it was. So, when I was looking at that section of coffee talk that inspired this uh, panel, um, I was looking at it and think that we didn't really have anything that drove like those specific cultural problems in our game because everyone is so hyper fixated on finding the killer or trying to tell you why they're not the killer even though they clearly are and um so what we have is all these different cultures influencing the interactions that you have so um one character akiko is uh romanian and she um she is the general of the, of the military force on the island and I started looking at Romania and history and, and development and uh, the, the islands as, it, as they are at the moment are kind of going through their classical age 
uh, the next island that they're about to give birth to is perfect, and that becomes their golden age. So I looked at the classical age of Romania, and during that time, they were trying to petition um, the emperor of Austria for uh, equal voting rights, uh, political rights, and that then played into Akiko's story, that she was petitioning the ruling council for her rights, uh, for her equal rights with her soldiers. So it was less about finding these problems, but then finding how we can influence this world with these different cultures. Uh, and as you know, a white British person, it is my job to get out of the way of all these characters and let their, the real world histories uh, speak to them, uh, let them speak for themselves and not try and put uh, my white British middle class straight uh, view on it. Because, you know, everyone's far too bored of uh, white straight dudes telling their story. So, um, so it's the like first character, Lydia, who comes from Africa, and her name, Lydia, was, uh, we, our law uses a lot of Sumerian, Mesopotamian, ancient civilization style uh, references and, and culture, and uh, so she, her name is a reference to the, to the Lydians, the old kingdom, um, but then I had to go and make sure that if she's from Africa, Lydia could be a name that came from Africa. So that's been like a big part of what I've been doing, is just making sure that this is all okay. Oh, okay. and, uh, and to make sure that these characters are being given room to speak uh, about their culture, and they all have something that uh, speaks to their culture and where they've come from, and how it, that then allows them to view the world. So, um, what, what kind of research did you do to, to find that thing? Uh, there's been a lot of reading. There was, uh, there's been some... This, fantastic to get uh, so many different ways of doing research now. Um, we have a character that is uh, a, a bit of a religious fanatic and is implicated in the murder. Uh, and we live in a time of some very narrow views on uh, other people's religion and how that makes them act. And so uh, I listened to the Caliphate podcast, which... Um, it's an investigative journalist podcast about uh, uh, interviewing, um, well, researching the caliphate in ISIS, and uh, they did a lot of talking to people that used to be fighters that have either been arrested or have left. And what really came through was that these uh, men are fighting not for their religious cause, but for their home and their life. After the West has ravaged their country, they were looking for an identity, they were looking for a cause. And so rather than being driven by this religious fervor, they wanted to be able to provide for their families. Uh, and they wanted to be able to belong to something and have a purpose. So it's trying to get past that like very easy Western view on things and dig just a little bit deeper and find um, where we can how people around the world are uh, what, what makes, makes them tick and how they how they come to be, and then allow that to hopefully come through in the game uh, with my British reserved way of writing. Okay. Uh, Fernando, yeah. How about like how do you do your research for the cultural stuff you found on Valhalla or Nirvana or any of your games? That one, that one's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say we do much research. We don't do much, much research. We try to keep things as, how to explain it? I, it's hard, uh, I find it hard to say we don't do research because we do read on the stuff we're, we're talking about and we try to get first accounts if possible or just an opinion from someone related to it. But in general, we try to instead, um, at, at least so far, at least up, up until Nirvana so far, we've tried to instead make it more like a culture that's new, so to speak. Come, because where I come from, uh, Latin America in general is 
basically a, a controlled melting pot. It's a place where where you had all manner of countries from Europe come in and take part for their own for wars. And then there's, for example, there's no concept of race, like for example, compared to the United States and stuff. And we try to keep we try to keep that sort of air where we don't try to stay relevant to the real world because in the end, uh, fiction and especially futurism and that sort of thing is a reflection of the real world. But we try to frame it in a way where we have what of what we're of what we're doing. For example, Bridge City isn't really any specific culture. Okay. Is it, is, it has parts of different cultures. You have mention, mentions of Asian countries. You have mentions of Latin American cultural stuff. You have mentions of American stuff. You have mentions of all manner of stuff from everywhere. But it's not one specifically. So, so that we can give everyone a, we can give everyone something they can See that see themselves reflected on, but not make it the focus focus to the point where where the the setting that we're trying to create because in the end we're trying to create a very specific setting so to speak um, that it becomes a detriment to that because that setting is going to be informed by by the stuff that gets mixed in so to speak. If we've had stuff like, for example, one teacher that people still love that we pointed out is when Jill mentions the difference between Cantonese and Mandarin in one of the conversations about Chinese, about the Chinese language. And that, that, for example, was something pointed out by Brian from Israel when he was testing the game. And, and we were like, yeah. That sounds cool. Let's just add that sort of thing. And that's the sort of care we try to take care of. The sort of stuff that that informs people that we care, that we put our effort, but at the same time, uh, that informs that you know it's part of a bigger picture. So so to speak. So um, uh, uh, by that when when Mal when Malhala came out and that one and. Um, Sorry, I, I got mixed there. Um, one of the things that people talked about a lot and that became a focal point of the game for better and sometimes for worse was uh, the diversity in gender identity and stuff that the characters have. That one was really tricky because just like Ollie, I'm like, I'm just a straight dude and I'm going to have to write characters from stuff that I'm not familiar with. And at that point, we were just like, you know what? Best we can do is just make them the best character we can be, they can be. Uh, whatever they identify as is just going to be a part of themselves. We want to treat it. For example, Jill being bisexual is no different from Jill liking to smoke. It's a part of herself that is reflected on how she acts and the world reacts to that part of her. But yeah, we just try. We, we just had a focus of let's try your best and hope for the best, and people reacted to it positively. That's interesting. I mean, like uh, what we did in Coffee Talk was, I guess, way more simple because uh, I, I was glad that we're based in Indonesia because Indonesia has like hundreds of cultures and language and races, like local races. And Toge has like 15 people in the team. And uh, at the beginning of the development, after the team played the first early build of Coffee Talk, uh, one, the prob one of the problem mentioned was all the characters sound like me, which is 1%. Uh, and yes. what we did afterwards is like, so all these characters, uh, the 11 characters, they have different backgrounds. They have characteristic. And my team also have different backgrounds, different characteristics, born from different cultures. So I just decided to, okay, this character, I think 
my artist is the one that's very similar to this character and then this character okay this is the programmer and what we did was we do a role play session where i just told them like okay so the scene is you guys will talk about blah 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 and then they just like do the chatting inside the meeting room and i just recorded everything and i turned their chats into the game which is like i think that's so, awesome yeah this, this, oh, that, yeah that's really helpful because at least it doesn't sound like me because it's not my voice it's it's those people i just like edit them to make it better to read and more formal i guess but the rest is like okay this is how they will react to this how they will react to this and which is like uh which is pretty difficult because for my next game i will be working with my own team and uh i will be the only writer and we are only like three people so i will i won't be able to do the same role play like i did with 15 people in the toge so i was like oh no what am i supposed to do now <laughs> yeah i guess that's the bit. and for the for the setting it's kind of funny because we set it in seattle and uh one part of the game mentioned a pizza place called rocos so chris uh my former boss and the one who wrote uh help me write in the game he put rocos and they were like oh you're based in seattle because you know rocos and we we're like uh we just like google best pizza in seattle and, then <laughs> 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 and we just put them in the game <laughs> yeah uh so i guess we don't have that much time left so i will go to the last question just pretty fast eh? uh from what you guys have learned from your previous games uh is there anything different you will do for you for your future games in terms of approaching the cultural context so uh, let's start with fernando actually can't think of anything uh, yeah i can i can think i will try that i mean obviously we're, we're always trying to do better in that sense but i can think of i can't think of anything specific that i try to do differently or best in that sense because i have a lot of things that i'd like to that i'm trying to improve with the writing and not really at all that that's not one of them because i kind of want to uh, in some sense double down on that sort of okay. cultural shock that that may be caused specifically because that makes the game that makes what we make it different it's like um i, I mentioned that that we didn't really have much of a focus on one specific culture or one specific type of thing if anything uh actually yeah i think the one thing that we'll try to do is just double down on that sort of stuff make stuff more defined so to speak make it more uh, add a bigger variety of well defined okay. things into the game that that let us that lets us explore uh, a bigger spectrum of stuff in more in more detail okay. yeah. that's the one thing i changed i i think how about you Oli? Uh, we had a lot of challenges on this game with the writing because because uh, it's non-linear, it's completely open. Uh, you can talk about any subject at any time. Uh, we and then every character has to fit a role within the story and the mechanics. It means that uh, we have to define things in a certain order, and I don't think we got it right. I think. I'm quite a mechanics based guy and we I I defined the structure and the mechanics uh, before the the cultural influence came in and then I think we've got it to a good point now but it took too long I think what would have been better is to define okay this is the crime this is how it happened here's how these people were involved now let's forget all of that and talk about who these people are with their cultures and then really kind of lock that in and really drill into it much deeper earlier and then bring the crime and the mechanics back and say okay how does this now influence this and and 
brought the, the two of them in the in parish they kind of ran like concurrently together whereas i think it'd be better to do one then the other and then this one comes in and influences that one and then we do this back and forth and be kind of better earlier on it and i'm quite happy where we've got the characters but i think it could have been better like more defined earlier and that would have led to better writing earlier because the same we had the same problem where for a long time all of the characters sounded like me and because i wasn't doing the cultural like bring all this stuff in because this is a, a world much like glitch city where uh we're not it, these people have made their own culture they brought all the influences in and brought and made their own culture and so it's not an, an exact mirror to the world uh but uh that could have been stronger earlier and that would have saved a lot of headaches i'm really glad that we got a publisher to give us some extra time because uh they did not the characters were not where they needed to be at the point where my money was about to run out <laughs> Okay, uh, I think uh, for, in my case, uh, one thing I learned from making Coffee Talk is like uh, the game was based on kind of fantasy Seattle, but people actually appreciate that it feels authentic. And, mm. But it was difficult because I never been to Seattle before this. And one thing I try to do for my future game is for my next game specifically is like rather than having it in a place where I don't know anything about, uh, why don't I try to make it based in my hometown, which is Jakarta? And I don't think there are any games that use Jakarta as a setting, even if they, there's one actually, one Splinter Cell from the PS2 era, <laughs> yeah, it was based in Jakarta, but you know, all Indonesians are terrorists in that game, so <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want Indonesia to be portrayed like that, so I guess it can help me make the games easier because I understand the culture, while at the same time, I guess it can introduce Jakarta and Indonesia to gamers around the world, hopefully. I guess that's the plan. <laughs> Wish me luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I really like uh, the Seattle in Coffee Talk. Thank you. Because I really enjoy, like, my favorite depiction of, like, American town is Deadly Premonition. Because it, they, those Eastern tapes on, in the West, we all know the Western tropes very well. And to see an Eastern take on that, and I hadn't even noticed people were smoking until you mentioned it. But I think it it, it gives it that flavour, and it gives it that that charm and soul that uh, when you're trying to create something very uh, in the West, try to create something very authentic to the West, you you, you lose that. That's why like GTA can never be made in the States. I mean, like, yeah, to be made made out of uh, your reasoning is actually why yeah. cyberpunk is interesting because cyberpunk is western take on eastern culture right mm. yeah it's basically that i guess yeah so the game so the game's based, based in seattle was was made by someone that never been in seattle yep and the game of the pretenders was made by someone that at that point in their lives didn't drink alcohol. Is there anything you want to confess on it? Is it the time now? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm uh, sure only you can kill anyone, right? I mean, you make Paradise Killer. I hope you never killed anyone. Well, not that I'm going to talk about on this panel, but once we turn the recording off, we can have a chat. <laughs> okay, then. I guess uh, that's all for this panel right now. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for joining in and thank you thank you so much hopefully uh this panel can be fruitful to anyone who's watching and i hope if you want to make i mean one one thing that i can learn from this is like make what you want because like all of us have different backgrounds and we're making different things but even with all these different things we still have like similar veins so don't worry about having something too similar because the game will be yours anyway, and just do it, I guess. That's what, that, uh, that's a really weird way to end a panel. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess that, that's, that's all from me, and thank you so much. <laughs>